the shooting range. In this episode, how the Soviet engineers were building a Ferdinand-proof tank, the Dornier DO-217N, an incredibly deadly fighter, hotline, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with Tier 4 Spitfires. A couple of episodes back, we'd started our journey into the huge Supermarine Spitfire family presented in War Thunder. For now, we've covered the second and third tiers, and now it's time to get to this line's finest. Today, we start at the F Mark 16 modification. It's at BR 5.0 which means it's got a lot more serious opponents than its predecessors. Comparing with the F Mark IX from the previous tier, this bird also has a different wing shape, and you'd expect to find some better armaments here. <laughs> but no, there are still two Hispano Mark IIs with 270 bullets and two Browning M2s caliber 12.7mm. Not exactly a deadly force, is it? The maximum speed here is 651 kph, which is decent, but not perfect. Climb rate is also not that amazing. But the turn speed is only 19.8 seconds, so a dogfight is your best option against any enemy, except for the Japanese ones. Next in line is the Spitfire LF Mark IX. Its BR is already 5.7, and it's one of the best on that rating. It's got a good turn and climb rate, and a decent speed. You can get to a higher position faster than anybody else, and then ground the enemies in a dogfight, though there are some problems. For example, at a speed above 440 to 460 kph, the aircraft becomes a lot harder to control. Also, the armament is still weak. The same Hispanos and the same Brownings. With this bird, your best chance is to take off, set it to climb and go and make some tea. Then return, observe the situation from outer space and destroy anyone who tries to get to those altitudes. Then we have the Griffin-powered Spitfires, the best of the best. Even the earliest model shows the difference between the start of this line and its later modifications. Another fuselage form, a five-blade propeller, and a completely new engine. This one can speed up to 726 kph and turn within 17.3 seconds. As for the armament, wait, what, Hispano Mark II and the Brownings again? Oh, we've got four machine guns now, all right, caliber 7.7, .7. not all right. Those engineers had some strange sense of humor. The more traditional option is the 14E version of this plane. It's 3 kph slower, it turns 0.1 second longer but the Hispanos are accompanied by the usual M2 Browning's caliber 12.7 millimeters. The main thing with these machines is not to get shot at and always control the higher position. A dogfight is still the standard option, but if you want, you can boom and zoom as well. Just don't break your wing. Armament is still quite weak, so you'd better get to a higher position and work from there on your less agile enemies. We won't talk much about the FR Mark 14E version. We'll only mention that, though it has a great maximum speed of 730 kph, it's a lot worse when it comes to turning. Going on to the Mark 18, still the same armament and the speed is even lower. But is there anything in return? Well. There's a good variety of bombs to fight ground tech. There are even some RP-3 missiles. 
yet it's quite hard to prove the Griffin's potential in mixed battles. Those machines were designed to fly at high altitudes. All the planes are from BR 5.7. Up next, the Mark 22 at BR 6.3. And finally, it's got some new guns. As many as four Hispano Mark V cannons with 650 bullets to spare. The speed is also great, 740 kph, but only above 8,000 meters. Turn rate, quite decent, 18.2 seconds. Climbing, 23.7 meters per second. This plane is also great at boom and zooming from high positions. But if you like a good dogfight, don't restrain yourself. Moreover, if you want, you can even take three bombs for 500 pounds each and unleash hell on Earth. Though we don't recommend using this machine like that. The Spitfire Mark 24 didn't go far from the Mark 22. It flies a little better and the armament is the same. The engineers did their best and couldn't pull this aircraft further into the jet era. Among its rivals in the same class, the Mark 24 is probably the best. 780 kph, 17.6 seconds turn rate, and climbing as much as 28.3 meters per second. But this climbing rate compared to the jets made this plane amazingly outdated. It was finally time to stop developing this line. And now, a story of the famous Soviet tank that wasn't good at timing. During the summer of 1943, the Germans used the Panthers and the Ferdinands for the first time in the Battle of Kursk. Before that, the Soviet soldiers faced their Tigers. The new tanks weren't numerous, but they went a lot further in terms of protection and firepower compared to those of the USSR. The Ferdinand was the scariest of them all. Its 88mm weapon easily pierced any Soviet tank at any angle, and the armor was almost invincible against the 76mm gun of the T-34. And it wasn't even a mass-produced tank. If it was to have gone into production, it would have been game over for the USSR. They needed to answer with their own tech, and fast, not only rearming the existing tanks, but building new ones. Of course, today we know that the Tigers weren't mass-produced either and couldn't change the outcome of the war. And the Ferdinand was just a quick refinement of Porsche's Tiger. But at the time, the engineers and the military couldn't have known that and they were preparing for the worst. As early as July 1943, they'd started developing the new tank called Object 701. It was meant to be the most powerful tank in the world. It had to survive frontal and side shots from even the 88mm gun of the Ferdinand. The 122mm gun could break German armor like it was nothing, and the maximum speed was about 40 kph. Keep in mind, it weighed like the Tiger. Object 701 wasn't pursuing the IS-1 ideas. Instead, it was created almost from scratch, combining the best solutions of the world tank industry of the time. For example, the cooling system was based on the enemy's Panther. The drivers got the long-awaited planetary transmission that provided easier handling and higher average speed. And in the heart of the machine was the V12 engine. Basically, the same famous Kharkiv model V2, but with a supercharger that pushed the power up to 750 horsepower. By the middle of the following year, they'd started testing the prototype. 
Of course, there were some initial problems, but within a year's time, Object 701 became faster than the IS-2 and equal to the T-3485. Engineers proposed starting mass production as soon as was possible, but the People's Commissar of Heavy Machine Building, Vyacheslav Malshov, understood that it could only be done by taking production power from the IS-2. The risk was too high. So while the war wasn't over, Object 701 was ordered to be tested and refined. There was already the new IS-3, and that had just gone into production. It was a wartime tank, without great durability expected, because wartime tanks were often very short-lived, and peacetime has its own demands. So after the victory, there was a whole tsunami of complaints on the reliability of the IS-3. Consequently, they'd ceased its production in 1946 and had launched one Object 701 instead, which then became known as the IS-4. The tank turned out to have some problems. It wasn't bad, but it did appear at the wrong time. After the war, the demands for reliability of the tanks became much greater, and it had to be seriously remodified. It also was too expensive and heavy. Ultimately, the military decided to set a maximum weight for heavy tanks at 50 tons, and the IS-4, alongside the IS-7, became obsolete. And now, a story of the great and terrible Dornier. The first retaliatory strikes of the British bomber shocked Nazi Germany. But it was one thing when the Blenheims, Hamdens and Wellingtons attacked by day, because they could have been intercepted by usual fighters. The real problem were the night raids. Not only did the Germans not have a single nighttime fighter, the command, thanks to Goering, completely ignored these attacks by the Royal Air Force. They thought that they would just stop as soon as Germany bombed the British industry out of the war. But the bombs just started growing in numbers. Finally, the High Command woke up and ordered their personnel to make nighttime fighters out of every single aircraft remotely suitable for the task. They picked three planes as the first priority ones. The BF-110, the U-88, and the family of Dornier DO-17 two-engine bombers. They also found a man to supervise the whole process. General Yusuf Kamhuber, who had the reputation of a rebel, a bully, and basically a pain in the collective ass of the Luftwaffe generals. And it was exactly the right man for the job. There was a lot to do. The BF-110 wasn't going very well with the new, heavier, and more powerful engines. Its one-spar wing couldn't just hold them. Plus, Messerschmitt had just severely cut the production of these birds in favor of the clearly disappointing ME-210. The U-88C turned out to be a good nighttime fighter, even though it didn't yet have decent radar, just a primitive infrared visor. But the Bomber Command wasn't eager to share the U-88s with Cam Huber, and he managed to turn only 50 of those into the night models. Then there was the Dornier. They created the DO-17Z Kaos, the first proper nighttime fighter of the Luftwaffe. By the version DO-215B, it received a decent radar and started earning its first victories. But then, the great trio shattered the skies of Germany. The Stirling, the Halifax, and the Lancaster. The cows just couldn't catch up with them, so they had to remake another plane for night flights. This time, 
the Dornier 217. It got the new guns and a radar but still retained a bomb hatch and defensive turrets. Why? Because not only the Dornier DO 217G could find and ground an enemy bomber in the night sky, it could also follow it to the home base, ground it on the glide path and then wipe out the base itself. There was always something to blow up. But the real terror got to the British pilots with the creation of the DO 217N. This nighttime fighter got the new DB603 engines and four-blade propellers. And instead of turrets and a bomb hatch, the engineers installed an additional fuel tank, four Schräger Musik guns, and a whole set of radio equipment. It wasn't just a new modern radar, there was even a device that could locate interference sources on the British bombers. Electronic warfare just reached the next level. In one of our previous videos, we've described the mystical horror that the Schräger Musiker guns caused with the pilots. They couldn't even understand what hit them. But these Dornier fighters went even further and managed to hit a lot of enemy bombers, not just without firing a single shot, but even without leaving the hangar. Just imagine the heavy four-engine bomber pilots' feelings on their way to home base, when they know that in the darkness behind there could have been an invisible two-engine monster with a load of deadly cannons. It might not be there, but what if it still had been? Gotta land as soon as possible, and then the pilots, rushing to finish their flight, hit their Stirlings, Halifaxes and Lancasters too hard on the ground, crippling the machines, making them another prey for the night of darkness. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question was asked by a user called Alex Vostox. Dear Gaijin, would you kindly to add more wheeled ground vehicle? I have a fever and my doctor prescribed more wheels. My love with a wheeled vehicle is up to 11. Can you smell that Gaijin? That's the smell of burning rubber tire. I love the smells of burning tire in the morning. It smells like victory. It's good that we're not in rapture and you couldn't just would you kindly us into this? But seriously, there will be more wheeled vehicles in the game. A player called Crazy Cat. Why did you guys decide to use the modern era for future content and not World War I and early World War II prototypes? Simply put, because if we did otherwise, we'd have to make the new machines the weakest in the game. Some sort of rank zero tech or new reserve tanks. There's little fun in that, don't you agree? And the modern era tanks promise new, faster and more interesting gameplay. So it was quite an easy decision. Then there is a question from Evan Head. Hey Gaijin, is it possible that you guys will add the Fritz X to War Thunder? Right now, definitely not. It has the same problems as the guided air-to-air -air missiles. Too powerful for the current state of the game. But feel free to ask us again when we launch the naval battles at its fullest. And the last very serious message was sent by Claudi Focan. Insert random comments that won't be picked by Gaijin. Here a completely random answer. Strawberry dogfight space madness. That's it for today. But feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all. And you might see some of them answered in the next episode. 
If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.